Okay, here we go. Good, good, good. My audio is working. Okay, fine. All right, Gene. So let me take you through this so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. So you get these these beautiful uh, uh, property packages from these brokers, and the first thing you're going to think about is where are they lying to me? How are they lying to me? Uh, because brokers lie all the time, and it's your responsibility to figure out where they do it to you, and they will. They always do. So the first thing they do is they show you that this uh, picture, and uh, you know it kind of looks like a picture of a palm tree with an apartment complex in the background, not an apartment complex with a palm tree to the side. Uh, let's get this thing here. Okay, fine. The thing about this is I look at it, and it's, okay, two-story, but the thing that jumps out to me first is uh, the fact that um, it's a flat roof. Now, I know down in Florida that you have a lot of flat roofs, uh, so that's something you want to be concerned about when you uh, look at it. And the other thing, too, is that you do not see any in-wall air conditioning units, which is a good thing, a very good thing. Uh, so, all right, fine. We'll move on. Offering details. Um, this is essentially their, their disclaimer that gives you the critical dates. Call for offers February 3rd. Obviously, we'll, we're beyond that. Yeah, I love this. Uh, keep this on. Don't show this mess again. Uh, offer submission, it tells you what they want. They want to have an asset price. They want to know what you're buying it for. They want to have due diligence and closing time frame. We'll give them that. Deal structure in each party's rights and responsibilities. Okay, fine, we'll give them that. Earnest money deposit and to include a resume of previous multifamily ownership experience as well as qualifications to close. All right, if that's really going to be an issue, you can use my resume. I'll get you that information. So right away, they give you the asking price. So you know that this is not going to be a TBD or t to be determined uh, by the market. The other thing it tells you is that it's uh, offered on, on an all cash free and clear sale. Now you might think to yourself, what does that mean? Why, why wouldn't it be that way? Well, if they were expecting you to assume the existing mortgage, that's why that's uh, what this means here. It means you are not assuming the existing mortgage. You're actually going to buy this with your own money or what we like to call a new money purchase. Um, okay, so more pretty pictures, more pretty pictures, more pretty pictures, more pretty pictures. Okay, what do they tell us here? Executive summary. Okay, the 55 plus community uh, with a rental upside and a full amenities package. Of course, it's always got an upside. Community was built in 70 and it's concrete block construction, which is very typical for down there in, Cal in uh, Florida. Lake Tarpon, uh, okay, excellent amenities, spacious clubhouse with a library, kitchen, and an entertainment area. Okay, blah, 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 I don't care about that. Now, over here, it'll tell me that 40 units built in 70, 100% occupancy. That's a lie. There's the first lie, okay? There's your first lie. There's no such thing as 100% occupancy. You cannot occupy a property uh, 12 months out of the year at 100%. Uh, because that would require everybody to continue to live in a 55-plus community, which is tough for them to do, and they would have to pay their rent on time every single month and never be delinquent once, uh, because if that were not the case, you can't. It's not 100% occupied. Listen, one person moves out to move in with their daughter, you don't have 100% occupancy. And you listen to the broker say, oh, well, what we mean is blah, 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 blah. Well, you know what? Brokers lie, and there's no such thing as 100% occupancy. Average unit size, 950 units. Average unit per rent is 781. And all cash, 2.75 million. All right, that is it. I'm going to grab from here. Oh, yeah, fine, fine, blah, blah, blah. You know, when I tell you, Gene, I've been in uh, over 3,500 apartment units in my career. They all look the same. I don't care what they look like. Uh, because it doesn't matter to me. I care about the numbers. Uh, more pretty pictures. You know, when they start to give you nothing but pretty pictures, you start to ask yourself, the more, you know, the more they uh, spoke of their honor, the more we counted our silverware. Um, okay, notable highlights. I don't care. 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 Okay, here we go. Maybe I can start to care. More pretty pictures. Okay, here. Now, up here... Okay, this is going to be important to us right here. See this this pair, this table right here. This is the, going to be the first thing that we do on the cash flow analyzer. So page 20. I'm just going to make a note for myself that I'm going to go back to page 20 on the PDF. All right. I'll show you why in a second. 
Uh, look at it. It's all the same stuff, same information. It just gives you the same information. Okay, more pretty pictures, pretty pictures, far away pictures, even further away. You know, God, what is it? How many pages? 41 pages of useless information. Here, uh, okay, four units have washer-dryer connections, which means that 36 units have no form of washer-dryer hookup, which means that there must be a laundry room. And if there is a laundry room, that means we have income from the laundry income. So we'll wait to see if we see that in the income and expense statement. Uh, roof is flat, built up. Uh, not good. Uh, electric with heat pump. Nine recently replaced AC units. Multiple metal AC stands have been replaced on the roof. So they, they, they hide their AC uh, units on the roof. Uh, electric hot water heater, so we want to find out who's paying for the electric. Foundation slab on grade. That's nice. And that's it. Okay, next page. Okay, recent capital improvements. We don't really care. We're going to find this out in the due diligence period, but, um, you know, we have to wait for that to come up. Okay, uh, let's just do a quick little... Um, I'm just going to... Okay... Still going. All right. Good, good, good. All right. Now the next uh, page, we're going to look at more pretty pictures. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at this. This is really where I want to be. This is the page I'm going to be looking at. Now I'm going to blow this up a little bit because it seems, you know, they've, okay, this is much easier for you to see. Okay. Now, the first thing we look at, this is the income and expense statement. First thing over here, we got the T12 from December 15th to November 15th on the income and the T12 for the same time period on the expenses. Perfect. Now look at what they do over here. They do a T3 and then they annualize it for the income and then they do a T12 for the expenses. Well, why? Why are you only using three months out of the year to annualize your income? It's because they're trying to manipulate the numbers to make things look good for them. It's the most, it, it's bordering on criminal. It's think about think about it this way, Gene. If the you know my 2010 sucked, my income was way down on 2010. My income on 2015 was a heck of a lot higher. My expenses for 2015, therefore, were a lot higher. I spent a lot of money because I had it. So what I'm going to do when I report my 2015 income is I'm going to take my 2010 income. And I'm going to match it up with my 2015 expenses. And then I'm going to report that to the IRS and say, this is what I earned this year. How long do you think I'm going to get away with that before the IRS throws me in jail? Not very long. So why do brokers do it? Brokers are the only people in the world who can get away with this. So you don't want to be in this situation. It's you use the trailing 12 for the income and matched up with the same time period for the expenses, period, end of story. And if the broker tries to tell you, well, you know what you really should do is do this, but it's like, you know what? No, we're going to use your actual numbers. Now, having said that, what we're going to do, let's take, for instance, the real estate taxes. Look at, they got 40,000, 2001 for last year, and they're using in their pro forma 40,793. Well, I'm going to use that. And look at their homeowners association dues next year went down. Why? Look how much the in, the interest went up. I mean, the insurance went up. 16000 versus 10000 Management fee went down. Why? Utilities didn't change that much. Let me see what else do they do. Everything else seems pretty pretty darn close, except look at the repairs and maintenance. 36000 versus 24,000. Oh, really? Why do you think it's going to be less expensive when I take it over to repair and maintain the building than it is than what they did? Oh, well, blah, blah, blah. And you listen to the brokers lie and they just lie all the time. Okay, let me see. This is their, um, you know, so this is what they've got. Okay. And I don't care any, about any of this. So, um, no, 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 no. None of this is right. Um, All right, I'm going to show you something in a second. Okay, first off, let me show you right now. Look at this price summary. Look what they did. They took and they said, well, the, under the current trailing three 
cap rate is 5.95%, but under the pro forma, it's 6.71%. Well, you know what? Those are both made up numbers. Why don't you tell me what it is that you're actually asking for in this property? Remember, 2.75 and the current NOI is 1.63. Now, Gene, remember, this is nothing more than a formula. If I take the 163594 and I divide it by 2750123, I come out with a cap rate of 5.9, which is what they're showing right here. All right. No, actually, you know what? That's the current. Let's see. Wait a minute. Trailing three. Current NOI is um, 168. And what are they showing here? Current. Yeah, 163. All right. No, I'll go with the 163. Okay, good. All right, we're ready to rock and roll. We got the information. Let's go back to that page 20 because we need to find page 20. And I'll show you how to start using the cash flow analyzer. Okay. 2.75 is a purchase price. Here we go. All right. First thing you're going to do is click on the input data section. All right. We're going to click on the down or choose multifamily. That really comes into play. And when you're building your offering memorandum, uh, the contract purchase price, they want 275. Now we're going to use their numbers here because we want to see how this thing uh, works out. I'm not going to put in any initial improvements or closing costs at this juncture. If I go through the offering package and I go, I go through the negotiations, I get the deal under contract, then I'm going to go back and start to really hammer it out and figure out what kind of a deal I've got. Now, remember, we said the uh, the interest rate, the cap rate was 5.9, right? So we put 5.9 right there in that number. Then we jump down to the financing. Okay, now this property, they're asking uh, 2.5 million. You know, if we did this on a straight up Fannie, Fannie Mae loan, we could get it for 20%. And the interest rate will probably be about 4.75% on a 30-year uh, amortization. Now, is that what really what we're going to do? When we put a 20% down payment in there, our debt coverage ratio is going to go down. Uh, is that because we're we're buying more more debt? So is that really what we want to do, or do we want to buy this property on a very conservative basis and use a 25% down number? Let's go with 25% down. Fannie Mae will give us 20 if this thing is, can be approved for Fannie Mae. Um, but let's be conservative in our initial uh, an est estimate to figure out if this is what we want to do. All right. Then we go and we click on the rent roll. Now, here is where things get interesting. Let's jump back over here to this page 20. One bedroom, one bath, 14 units, 800 square feet. One bed, uh, one uh, bath. Uh, how many units do we say? This always happens. I always forget. 14,800. 14,800. Uh, 14 units, 800 square feet. Holy cow, that's a big one bedroom. That's a very, that, is that right? Four, one bed, one bath. 800 square, that's huge. Okay, market rent is 750. Okay, I didn't say the current rent, I said the market rent for one beds and one bath in that area. So, two bed, one bath is uh, what do we have there? Two bed, one and a half bath, 18, 1000. Man, these things are big. 18, 1000. And this is 1.5, so let me go back and fix that. 1.5. And the rent on that, 7.75. Jeez, these numbers seem really weird. 7.75, whereas a one bedroom costs 7.50. Hmm, this is strange. Okay, then what else do we have? Two bed, two bath, eight, eleven hundred, eighty-five. Uh, eight, eleven hundred. Eight, eleven hundred. What do we say? Eight fifty. Uh, let's go back just me. Yeah, eight fifty. So what they're telling us here, and this is what you need to understand, is what they're telling us here is that um, the what they're telling us here is that 
this property can get those rents. That's the market rent. So when we put these numbers in here, the market rent, the top potential gross potential number for that property um, is going to be $375,000 a year. And at a 5% interest rate, it collects 356. Now, did it do that? Well, I don't know. Let's go take a look. Let's go back down to that uh, number where they talk about the trailing 12. Pretty pictures. There we go. I hit one too far. Now, let me blow this back up for you so you can see it. All right. Market rents, 341. What did we say the market rents were? We said the market rents were 375. Oh, these brokers don't even know what they're talking about. Market rent, loss to lease. You see, the thing is they put the loss to lease is zero. And we are going to show them exactly what their loss to lease is. Okay, so they have vacancy loss is zero, bad debt is zero. So in other words, what they're saying is this property collected in cash 341000 But we know that it it could have collected 375 and it's showing 356 because we have 5%. This number right here, this 356, has to equal the 341. Okay, so what does that mean? To do that, we got to go to 7%. We have to go to 9% right there. See, 341,000 is the effective rental income. 341,000. And in order to get that, to get, get to 341,000 off of a maximum gross potential of 375, this property is running at a 9% vacancy. Remember how they told you it was 100%? I'm telling you right now, looking at the numbers, it is 9%. This property is not 100% occupied. It's 91% occupied. Now, the problem with this cash flow analyzer is that this number, this vacancy rate, takes into consideration the vacancy loss, the bad debt, and the loss to lease. It lumps all three of these zero numbers that you see here, puts them all together, and lumps them all together and says, this is what um, the property is really running at from a cash flow standpoint, okay? Now, we've got to put in some other numbers here. It's got 10,000. Look at, we've got this other income of, of um, 6963, all right? 6963 plus 4993 equals almost 12,000. So it's, it's like almost, it's 11,900. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to say down here under other income, $1,000 a month. Okay, whoops. Let me fix that. It should be 1,000. Now, I won't worry about parking. Look at the number of inputs. This is, the, this is the, the screen I wanted to show you. Up to 10. See, if you had uh, up to 100, Boom, 100, up to 10. Boom, there's your 10. See, this is on the type of unit, the lease description, not the number of units, okay? So you don't need 40. There's your 40 number right there. Now, having said that, let me find, why is this thing not, um, interesting, it's not fixing it. should be fixed. But uh, the issue here is that, um, okay, we've got this thing called utility reimbursement. Hmm. So they're getting reimbursement for some utilities to the tune of $5,000, but you know it's that's $125 per unit. Hold on a second. Let's read the footnote on that one. Utility reimbursement, utility reimbursement of 400 of $40 per month are currently in place on 13 units. The pro forma assumes these units will include uh, maintain such utility reimbursements, while new leases will not break out such reimbursement charge and will include water, sewer, and trash. Huh. Yeah, that's important to know, especially when you're going to do your due diligence and you've got to be breaking out these these costs. That is, I don't like the way they do that. Um, you know, for instance, look over here. It says uh, utility reimbursement. Where are you? Uh, let me see. It was back, actually back over here. Utility reimbursement right here of $125 per unit. Uh, well, that's not really true. That's because you only are doing it on 13 units. So it's really $40 per unit. So that's, you know, I don't like it when these guys try to do this. Hey, we're going to sell a property next year. Let's start getting a utility reimbursement on everybody. Well, we got 17 people out of 40. 
uh, let's you know let's sell it to the next guy using those numbers and tell him that he can get all this extra money, which isn't usually the case. I mean, you got to go out there and collect it. So that's part of the problem here with these utility reimbursements. And you read the footnotes and you see it's not really that way. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to start banging out these numbers. Uh, repair, repair and maintenance, 36916. I'm going to click over here to expenses. Repair and maintenance, 36916. All right. Well, let me tell you something. That's $922 per unit. That far exceeds my rule of thumb for repair and maintenance. What's the next number? Leasing and commissions. Holy cow. Wow. That is a huge number, uh, and that that number is a problem for me. Um, and commissions is fourteen thousand dollars. That's huge because you're paying a salesperson that kind of money. Why don't you just hire somebody to work on the property and show the units, and don't give them a commission? That's huge. General and admin, 2094. Let's just throw that up here. G, uh, GNA, 2094. Next one, marketing, 893. Advertising, 893. $22 per unit per year. Well below my, my uh, number because... Well, you're at 100%. Who cares? Contractor services, 7636. Let's just throw that up here. 7636. Utilities, 33083. Uh, we'll just stick other 330063. Is that the right number? 33083. Okay, I'll fix that. Management fee. Okay. Well, here we're going to take the management fee and call it 6%. It's only 40 unit property. 23. What they have at 23. So they're right at 6% also. 10882 for the insurance. 882. All right. Insurance Homeowners Association. Wow, that's a pretty big number. And here's the thing you want to find out is, what does that cover? What do I get for that homeowners association? Association, association. Okay, uh, homeowners and the real estate tax is forty thousand bucks. Okay. We get the taxes down here, forty thousand. We'll just throw forty thousand. Now, how do we look? Well, G and A is pretty. It's right. Marketing is right. Contractor is uh, okay. Insurance is actually for Florida is kind of low, but you're on the west coast of Florida, so the numbers over there may be less because the hurricanes are less uh, strict. Repairs and maintenance is outrageous. Nine hundred twenty-two. That's crazy. That should be between. 400 and 700. Uh, that means there's something wrong. And here's the problem with that repair and maintenance is at $922, but your payroll, you don't even have a payroll. You don't even have a payroll. So who is spending all of that repair and maintenance money? The guy who's uh, working for, you know, leasing and commission at 14000 it doesn't make sense. Okay, so just so you understand this, Gene, you have all of these numbers tie together. They all interact with each other. And if you see one number that doesn't make any sense, you got to look at it from the other side. So if you have a very high repair and maintenance number, but you don't have any payroll, well, who's driving to Home Depot? Who is buying the, the the equipment that you need to buy? Who is walking into Unit 301 and fixing Mrs. Smith's sink? And where is the payroll for that on here? Now, if they say, oh, well, that's covered under contract services, you say, well, then put that number under contract services. Why are you putting it under, under repair and maintenance? 
that, there, that there's a reason why there's a different category for ca contract services and a different category for repair and maintenance. And if you see a very high repair and maintenance number, you should have a corresponding high number for payroll. And here, they're showing you nothing. That's the first red flag. Remember what I told you when we first started talking? You got to find out where they're lying to you. They're lying to you right there. And we need to figure out why and what this all means. And hold on, I'm going to go grab my bottle of water because I'm chatting away. And I think I, I think there's... Uh, Boy, I don't know if there's like an allergy thing going around because my throat is so scratchy. Okay. Now, the other thing you want to look at is this homeowner association. 15000 bucks. The question with it there is, what do I get for being in this homeowner's association? Do you do my landscaping? Okay, great. So I don't have to worry about landscaping. Do you do my painting of my outside of my buildings? Oh, no, I have to do that? Okay, fine. So you need to go and ask yourself, what do I get for that homeowner's association? Does it cover another aspect of the insurance on my property? So in other words, do I need to worry about the exterior insurance claims on my property, or do I only have to worry about interior claims? So therefore, that's why my insurance number is so much lower. So you've really got to figure out what is covered by that homeowners association. These are the types of questions you're gonna be asking the broker before you go you go to town on it. Okay, now let me just check one thing. I said the taxes were 40,000 and look at that. Isn't it amazing how insur uh, taxes go up very, very slowly in, on the pro forma. Uh, and let me see, insurance, actually they went up to 16,000 on the pro forma. So on the insurance, I'm going to stick in 16,000 here. You always go with the higher number. If the pro forma is higher than what you're looking at, you go with the pro forma. Uh, management fee, boom, utilities, contract services, uh, all that's fine. Repair and maintenance. I love how the repairs and maintenance goes down when you own the property. But whenever everyone else owns it uh, or someone else in the pro forma, it's only going to cost you 24000 because you're wonderful as an as an owner, you've you know you've got so much experience, Gene. You can keep those repairs and maintenance under control more than this experienced owner can do. Really, guys, seriously. Okay, so I got the numbers all in where I want them. It shows an expense ratio of 53%. Now I told you the issues I'm having with some of these numbers. But 53% when the tenants pay their own utilities on a property like that, like this, is probably right in line. So the expense ratio is right in line with my rule of thumb. But you still need to get those questions answered that I talked about. Because if they can't answer them or they answer them incorrectly, your expense ratio is going to go up and this property is not going to look as attractive. But right now at the expense ratio that they're talking about, 53%, Okay, so that looks pretty good. Let's move on with our analysis here, okay? So we've got this. Now we click on the cash flow analysis, CFA, and we scroll down. And we scroll down. Okay, so I go straight to the financial measurement number 1.27 debt coverage ratio. Uh uh. We are not buying this property at a 1.27 debt coverage ratio. Now, listen, the bank will give you a loan on a 1.25, but you're not buying it at a 1.25 because that satisfies the bank. It doesn't satisfy you. You, Your debt coverage ratio number is your sleep number. That's what's going to help you sleep at night. If the number is too low, you are always going to be wondering, can I make my mortgage payment this month? And you do not want to be in that situation. So the thing about a debt coverage ratio is it is a dynamic number. Don't think for a second that you num your, your uh, debt coverage ratio has to be a set number. Like, oh, it's got to be 1.5 on all, every single property I look at. No, the debt coverage ratio can vary based upon the quality of the asset. If you're dealing with an A-class property, you can go with a lower debt coverage ratio. Why? Because A-class residents 
pay their bills. They don't want to be evicted. They don't want to have any blemish on their credit, so they pay their bills. You can live with a 1.3 to 1.4 debt coverage ratio. If you're dealing with a C-class property, you cannot buy it for less than 1.6. If you buy for less than 1.6, you are going to be up every single night because C-class residents, if they, if they get behind on their rent, they will pack up all of their worldly belongings in a trash bag and move across the street to the next property. And you will never collect a dime from those people. So that's why when you're dealing with C-class residents, you need a higher debt coverage ratio than the 1.3 for an A-class property. So what is this property? Is it an A? Is it a B? Is it a C? I don't know. But 1.27 is not going to work for me. So how do we fix that? Well, let me show you something right here. Actually, I think I, I think I already did this with you. If I go to the input data and I scroll down, yeah, I'm putting 25% down already. I don't want to put any more money down. So the solution is to reduce the purchase price. Now, let me go back here. At a 5.9 debt coverage ratio, this property comps out at 2.77. We're asking for 2.75, but for some reason, the numbers are just not working. Let's go back to the cash flow analysis. Look at the cash on cash return. It's at 5%. Don't worry about this red number. This red number means that if you sold the property, if you sold the property at the end of the first year, what would your cash on cash return be? Well, when you figure in a 6% selling commission and all those other expenses, you're going to lose money if you have to sell this thing at the end of the first year, but that's not your strategy. So don't worry about that red there. That's what that throws a lot of people off. But what we really want to look at here is the cash on cash return before taxes. 5%. That does nothing for me. I, I don't care about that. Now, that's. Do I really want to buy this property if it's only going to give me a 5% cash on cash return? No. No, but what if we said it was a 10 or a 12? Well, what we do is we come back up here and we click on the goal seek. And I say, I want to solve for the offer the purchase price, cash on cash before tax, such that it's going to give me a 12% return at the end of the first year. What do I have to solve for? 2.127. Now, we said 2.75. What if we said 2.25 at 2.25 million? We are buying this thing. This, is, this property is looking pretty darn good now, right? So look at the cash flow analysis. At 2.25 million, it's 1.55 debt coverage ratio at 10% cash on cash return. Okay, I'm excited about that. That's a good offer. So let's make an offer at 2.25 million. Remember, don't worry what they're asking for. Don't worry about what they're asking for. The biggest lie in multifamily is the asking price. What you have to do is go back and you have to talk to the broker and say, hey, listen, I'm having trouble getting to the numbers that I need to at your 2.75 million. It's just not working for me. If I go back and I put in the, the, the expenses that we talk about, and I got to tell you, I still have some issues with two of your expenses. I'm looking at, a, at an expense ratio of in the mid-50s. And I know that marketplace, and I, you know, I, I really want to get something going in there, but I just, I'm, I'm ready to make an offer at 2.25. What do you think the seller is going to do? Reject it. Well, I tell you what, I'm going to make the offer anyway. Have them reject it. Have them counter it. I really want to figure out what the right price is. It, the right price for me is not 2.75. So have your seller counter me because I want to find out where I need to be. Talk that way to the broker and figure out what's going on. So. Um, that's how you use the cash flow analysis. The biggest, the toughest part for most people is this part right here, where you come up with the vacancy rate, and you put right in here all the market rents, and then you figure out what the effective rental income is. And remember, the rent effective rental in income you can typically find on the on the income and expense statement, but the effective rental income is not the total income. You don't want to include things like the utility reimbursement or the uh, laundry income, all of those types of expenses. You don't get, all we're talking about here is rental income. That's it. All right. So once you figure out the rental income, 
the effective rental income and the gross potential rental income, you'll know the difference between those two is the, what the true vacancy rate is of this property. So remember, I told you brokers lie, and I told you they said 100% 9%, occupancy, and I said there's no possible way. According to their own numbers, this property is running at 91%. So they're lying to you on page one. Okay, so just understand how those numbers get calculated, and that's what we do. All right, Gene, um, so here's what I want you to do. We're going to make an offer on this property. Uh, you're going to have a conversation with a broker on, on a couple of those issues, and then you're going to take the same form of analysis, how I just did it, and do it for the next property. And then you and I are going to talk about tax credits and what that means to the deal. Okay? All right, pal, good talking with you. I'll chat later.